Hello everyone, uh, George Kostandi here and uh, welcome to Origin and Causes new webinar uh, titled Emergency Shoring Rules of Thumb and Common Mistakes. So I first wanted to say I hope you and your families are in good health and in safety and I'm glad you are all, all able to join us today. I just want to go through a couple of quick points with you first. We're going to be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions via the text box um, under the webinar screen. You'll see it right here. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible within the hour uh, at the very end of, at, at the Q&A portion. If we don't get to your question in the webinar, we promise to follow up with you after and make sure that your questions are answered. All questions will be anonymously addressed, and uh, all information that's discussed in this webinar is for educational purposes only and should, be, uh, should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. We recommend that you contact a forensic expert to go through the circumstances or, or um, the details of a particular claim just to verify the right course of action. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website, LinkedIn, and YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass them on to your colleagues um, if you think that they would benefit from it. Also, uh, we will be sending you completion certificates in a follow-up email. It usually takes about a week or so to come in. So uh, make sure you uh, keep your eyes open for that. Um, and also at the very end of the webinar, um, when you're closing the GoToWebinar window, the program is going to prompt you to answer a few questions about the webinar. We'd love to get your feedback, um, your ranking about the speaker, about the content and, and other uh, feedback that we request of you. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, please feel free to email us at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. All right, let's get started. So first, I, I do want to say that uh, Yasser Karani was supposed to be joining us as a presenter today. Unfortunately, he had a last minute uh, emergency that uh, required his attention. So um, we have Nabi joining us today. He was supposed to be presenting the second portion. Now he, we're lucky we'll have him for the full presentation. Um, and I'll go through Nabi's credentials now. So Nabi Gurdazi is a professional engineer, um, licensed in Alberta, Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. His specialties include civil and structural engineering, earthquake engineering. He investigates damaged or under-designed structures, assisting with the review and design of retrofitting schemes. And he conducts structural investigations on industrial, commercial, and residential buildings. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'll uh, pass on the mic to Nabi Gurdazi. Thank you, George, and good afternoon, everyone. So in this presentation, I'd like to talk about the importance of shoring, emergency shoring systems, shoring rules of thumb, common mistakes in typical shoring scenarios, typical shoring details, and we give some concluding remarks. First of all, shoring, the importance of shoring systems. It's life safety, and it's to minimize the, the damage. Um, without shoring, the damage can extend to other parts of the building. And to satisfy Ministry of Labor regulations, uh, which requires uh, a safe environment for the workers. And also without shoring, the contractors can possibly be held liable. So there is a liability issue as well. Emergency shoring systems include shoring walls, wood posts, adjustable steel posts, needle beams, and diagonal braces. So now I'd like to talk, talk about shoring walls. And I'd like to talk about the concepts of the shoring walls and a lot of these concepts also apply to other shoring systems as well. So first of all, studs needs to be correctly aligned under floor joists. The entire wall may sway sideways and or the studs may bend or buckle depending on the wall height. So a shoring wall is a group of studs. So in this illustration, I'm showing the studs here. 
And this is the bottom plate of the shoring wall and the double top plate of the shoring wall. And these are the joists that are to be supported by the shoring wall. If you just erect this wall, it can fail uh, under some failure mechanisms. In, in any shoring systems in general, we need the force uh, to be supported effectively. So if this is the force on the shoring system or shoring wall, we need we like it to have effectively supported by the shoring system and go to the base of the shoring system or shoring wall here. Now, without uh, this shoring wall, as I said, in this system uh, can fail in multiple mechanisms. One is side sway. If you have a compressive force here, it can create a small lateral force here because of some misalignment or non-uniformity of the material or vibrations. Uh, this lateral force can eventually cause the shoring wall to uh, side sway as shown here. The other failure mechanism is the buckling of individual studs. So again, you have the compressive force from above, which are carried by studs. And because of misalignment of the studs with the joists and everything, you can have a uh, small lateral force. And that small lateral force can cause the stud to buckle. And uh, the other thing, so, so you need to have cross bracing to prevent buckling. But if you only have cross bracing, this is good to prevent buckling of the intermediate studs, like these guys. But the last ones, they still can buckle because they have long, understrained uh, length. And if you only have blocking, you think that you are restraining uh, the studs from buckling, but they are still, um, they can buckle because under all these compressive forces, you have small lateral force and all these lateral forces eventually uh, can create the condition where all the studs can buckle in one direction. So an effective shoring wall is one that, first of all, the, um, a stud is placed under each joist and um, it's, the studs are diagonally braced uh, and this, the diagonal braces should match the stud size and the braces should be at 45 degrees uh, angle to maximum 60 degrees angle. Um, and the diagonal braces should be fastened to each stud with uh, two, three inch long nails. And the studs, uh, the bracing can be 10 feet spacing uh, maximum. Uh, beside the uh, cross bracing, you should also have a uh, blocking here. The shoring walls, um, as a typical uh, detail uh, for common uh, scenarios, um, if the wall height is less than 10 feet, you should use two by four studs. If it's between 10 feet to 12 feet, use two by six studs. And if it's between 12 feet and 16 feet, again, use two by six studs. But the bracing of this shoring wall should be double tiered. So one cross bracing at top and one at the bottom. And you should have a two by six horizontal member here to transfer the forces. Now, the cross bracing, as I said, the cross bracing should match the stud size of the shoring wall. Uh, here in these illustrations, these green lines are the studs. Uh, this is the blocking between the studs. And these lines are the cross bracing. Uh, when, there's a, when there's a lap here, the lap distance should be at least one spacing of the studs. And the lap, when, where you have a lap, you should have a blocking. And the cross bracing should, nail, should be nailed to the studs and also the blocking. Instead of lap splice, you can have the butt splice. So the cross pressing come and 
and they are connected at the ends using a um, tilted blocking here. Uh, and this and the cross spacing are nailed to the blocking. Now, rules of thumb in uh, shoring systems. The first one is shoring location. So the shoring, uh, the wood or steel shoring uh, should be at maximum 12 inch from the end of masonry lintels and wood headers. So let's imagine you have a vehicle impact here. And uh, at the top of this door, you have a header beam or lintel. And when this wall is damaged, the post here is also damaged. So you need to put a shoring post here, and this shoring post should be at 12 inch maximum from the from uh, the edge of the wall. Otherwise, this length uh, would be cantilevered, would be unsupported. Again, imagine uh, uh, that you have a damage to the wall. So if you want to erect a shoring wall, the shoring wall should be uh, with, with a small offset from the supported load. Most of the times up to 24 inch offset uh, is okay. So here we are showing uh, the ground and here is the damaged exterior wall of a house or commercial building. And it happens a lot like due to some vehicle impact or fire or something. And you have the floor joist and you have the exterior wall of the second floor. So obviously, uh, because this wall is damaged, you need to put a shoring wall here. And this shoring wall should be uh, as close as possible to this, um, to the supported exterior wall. Otherwise, the load that you have here uh, would be uh, would be far from the support would be far from the support and this is the cantilever distance we need to minimize the cantilever distance um, another point about shoring location imagine that uh, you have damage to the exterior load bearing wall and these are the roof trusses uh, sitting on the exterior wall uh, you put the shoring wall here and uh, you you should put it at a minimum, possibly minimum uh, offset. Now, if the bottom cord of the truss is two by four, uh, you should put, you should have maximum 16 inch offset. If it's two by six bottom cord, because two by six is stronger, you should put the shoring wall at maximum 24 inch. Now, imagine there is a tree impact. The tree has damaged the top cord of a truss or the rafters, and it has also damaged the exterior wall here. So because uh, the truss is damaged, you need to put a shoring wall underneath the truss, and that shoring wall need to be located at the bottom cord panel point, which is this is the panel point of the truss. So you need to put the shoring wall here. And the top plate should be uh, fastened to the bottom cord. And you also need to add two by four web bracing at four feet maximum if webs are longer than four feet. So these are the web members. If they're longer than four feet, you need to put these horizontal bracing. Also, at the bottom cord, you need to put two by four bottom cord bracing at four feet maximum. Unless you have a drywall here, which is not damaged, then that's okay. But uh, if you don't have that, or if that's damaged, you need to put this bracing here. And um, the other thing is um, for the shoring locations, the shoring post. Uh, need to be installed under point load, such as the case, uh, such as the case of intersecting beams. Sagging steel beams also need to be supported. So imagine that in a house 
or a commercial building, you have an intense fire here, and you have a steel beam here, which is supporting an exterior wall. This is considered a point load on this steel beam. So you need to put a, a steel post here to support the point load. Now, if you remember, I said the, uh, the shoring system should effectively support the, the forces and they need to support the forces all the way to the ground or basement. For that, uh, if you are on a ground that is soft, you need to use bearing pads. So use outrigger pads or build your own 12 inch by 12 inch bearing pads or outrigger pads or 16 inch by 16 inch bearing pads under posts if bearing on softer surfaces. So the bearing pads need, need to be constructed of three layers of exterior grade half inch uh, or the three quarter inch plywood sheets. So total thickness of one and a half inch thick uh, bearing pad. And secure the sheets together with number eight, uh, one and a half inch long structural screws spaced in a four inch by four inch uh, square pattern with a two inch edge distance. Uh, so this fastening is to make sure the bearing pad sheets are uh, working all together and uh, create a safe surface for the shoring post. Now, the shoring wall needs to be installed on level ground. Sometimes it's not possible and the ground, you have some unevenness of the ground. In those scenarios, you need to use shims. So this is uneven ground, so you need to use shims, uh, ideally also under the studs, where you have the studs. Uh, so use shims or holding wedges. So the same as the supported joists. So use shims or folding wedges where even and tight bearing on the plate cannot be achieved. For example, if the joists are not of uniform size or if they have gone under non-uniform displacement. So these are the supported joists here. Uh, they are supported by the shoring wall underneath. So let's say this joist has charred more and has displaced more. So you don't have a level elevation here. So there, there will be some gap here between the joist and the uh, shoring wall. So you need to fill those with folding wedges. So about the vertical shoring, locate shoring under or as close as possible to the supported members. Ensure direct and tight contact with the supported members. Ensure continuous and safe load path to the foundation or ground. As I said, from the supported member to the foundation or ground, it needs to be continuous and effective. Allow I'll always erect shoring on clean, level, and sound surfaces. If it's not level, use uh, shims or folding wedges. Avoid placing shoring where it will hinder the repair work. We'll talk about this. So for diagonal shoring, sometimes you need to have diagonal shoring. Diagonally brace affected foundation, exterior, or veneer walls to prevent toppling. We will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Diagonal braces should be erected at a maximum of 60 degrees and a minimum, minimum of 45 degrees. Um, laterally brace shoring members in compression to prevent buckling. As I mentioned in about the shoring walls, you need to laterally brace the shoring, the, the, the studs um, to brace them from buckling. Ensure that the reacting cleats are properly secured. We will talk about that in, in our details and uh, uh, common scenarios. Now, about adjustable posts. Use steel posts that are three inch minimum in diameter. Space steel posts no more than six feet apart. Uh, the capacity of the steel posts need to be 8,000 pounds to support beams and floors, and it needs to be 15,000 pounds under point loads. Verify post capacity, and remember that 
capacity decreases with height. The steel posts, the, steel, the adjustable steel posts, they come with specifications. And in those specifications, you can see tables where it tells you the capacity of the steel posts versus the height. So be mindful of that. Now, typical emergency scenarios. So fire damage to floors and roofs of dwellings, residential dwellings or commercial buildings. Fire damage to detached structures, including garages, we get them a lot. Vehicle impact damage to garage walls. It's like 30% 30, 30 of our files are vehicle impact to, uh, to walls and garage walls. Tree impact damage to roofs of dwellings. Tree or vehicle impact damage to covered porches. Partial collapse of exterior walls during underpinning. Now, now that we have covered the basics of shoring, now let's see what are the common shoring mistakes that we've encountered in, in our daily job. So common shoring mistake scenario one. Now, imagine there's a damage to second floor joists due to a fire in the kitchen of a house or commercial kitchen. Um, so you need to use shoring. You should make sure that carry, you should make sure that the shoring walls are extended down to the basement level. So in this figure, I'm showing concrete basement, concrete foundation, concrete footing. This is the uh, ground. This is the main floor, exterior wall, second floor. So this is a section of the building. So imagine you have a fire here and the second floor joists are damaged. So we need to have a shoring wall here and this shoring wall need to be extended to the basement concrete. And a lot of times we've seen this shoring wall is missing. Without this shoring wall, the joists of the main floor is will be overloaded. The second scenario is assume there is extensive damage to floor joists due to fire in the basement near a foundation wall. It can happen a lot um, in commercial or residential buildings. Diagonal bracing is needed if the concrete foundation wall is supporting more than four feet of soil or if masonry foundation walls supporting more than three feet of soil. So in this diagram, I'm showing the concrete basement, concrete footing, and concrete foundation wall. This is the ground, and these are the floor joists, and this is exterior wall. So imagine there's a fire here, the floor joists are damaged, and you need to put shoring here for sure to vertically support the floor joists. Also, you need to have this diagonal bracing because this is the ground, so, so this is the ground. So you have a lateral force from the soil. Before, when the joists were good, the floor joists were good, these lateral forces were supported by the, by the floor joists. Now, without uh, effective floor joists, this concrete wall doesn't have the top support, so it can easily topple. So you need to have diagonal bracing. And a lot of times, these diagonal bracing are, are not uh, erected, which is a very dangerous situation. Scenario three is when the roof structure of a dwelling or commercial building is completely com consumed by fire. You need, uh, we need to diagonally brace exterior walls, especially where no intersecting walls existed or if they were also damaged by fire. So imagine in a commercial building or a house, you have a fire here, the roof is gone, and these are the exterior walls, and there are no intersecting walls to support these. Uh, we need to uh, diagonally brace these walls, otherwise these walls can tip over. Scenario four, Again, these are the mistakes that we often see in our um, 
in our daily uh, files. Uh, wood framing of the roof and walls of a detached structure is damaged by fire. Um, diagonally brace freestanding brick veneer until demolished. So let's say here, this is a garage and the framing and also the roof is damaged. Now, these brick veneer, veneers are now without any support. So they need to be supported diagonally and more often than not, they're missing. Scenario five, there's a damage to a wall segment between garage doors due to a vehicle impact uh, to a two garage. It can be a uh, commercial, commercial or industrial building or a house. Both middle post and veneer are damaged. Shoring must be provided to both brick, veneer and wood framing behind. So if there's a garage door and the side, the wall beside it is damaged, um, then the loose angle lintel here doesn't have support. Doesn't have support, uh, doesn't have effective support at the ends. Also, the header beam here will not have an effective support. So, uh, shoring need to be installed under the loose lintel and also under the, the header beam. Now, often we go to the site and we see this shoring, uh, this shoring post here, but this is missing. This is, this is a very important shoring post because this header beam is carrying the roof or maybe even the upper floor. Scenario six. So imagine there's a vehicle impact damage to a shared wall and we, we have seen it a lot, to a shared wall of an attached garage and a dwelling. Shoring should not be placed where it could obstruct reconstruction. So this wall here is damaged and if you put a steel angle, if you uh, put a steel angle here and install steel posts here, um, it's good. You are shoring the wall, except that now these posts are, are in the way of the repair work. So in these situations, you need to have a needle beam. So you put a needle beam here to come um, to be to come out of the wall, and then you put posts. Scenario seven, so we get a lot of these files where the corner post of a covered porch, uh, covered porch is broken due to a tree or vehicle impact. And you cannot put vertical posts under beam uh, because the deck is also damaged. So uh, we need to provide a diagonal shoring post or a needle beam and two posts. So uh, there's a damage there's a damage here to the corner post and also damage to the deck due to some tree impact, which is very commonplace. And you cannot put a vertical post, so you need to put a diagonal post, either that or put a needle beam. Put a needle beam here and put two posts here, okay? Scenario eight is where uh, there is a broken roof rafter due to a tree impact. Repairs will not commence until after winter. Sometimes it happens. Provide temporary provide temporary support to broken rafters or trusses. It happens a lot that there's a tree impact and the roof rafter is damaged. And uh, we've gone to site and we have seen that the shoring wall is installed um, under the ceiling joists, which is good, except that there's nothing be between the ceiling joist and the rafters. 
there should be a support, there should be a shoring strut between the seating joists and the rafters. Scenario nine, so in the scenario that we, they just talked about uh, the tree impact um, on the roof, often there's a hole on the roof. So if you cracked or broken rafters and there's a large hole in the roof due to tree impact and repairs are not likely before winter, uh, placing a sheeting board over the hole is not, if, is not sufficient. So it's not enough to just put a sheeting and leave it there for three to four months of winter. Um, it can fail under snow load. So it needs proper framing. Now, so now we've seen uh, common mistakes uh, that we encounter in, uh, in a lot of files. Now let's see uh, what uh, are the typical details that we recommend for, for common scenarios. So one, uh, about the needle beam shoring. Uh, if you remember, I talked about uh, vehicle impact to the wall. So when you get that situation, uh, where there is vehicle impact to a shared wall between an attached garage and the dueling, you need to put needle needle beam. So these needle beam extend to either side of the wall, and then you put uh, shoring posts, and then you can do the uh, repair here. The needle beam need, needs to be at least three ply two by eight, and the shoring posts should not be more than six feet apart. So this is the, so if I, if I cut a section here, what you will see is this. So this is the wall. You put the needle beam here. Uh, the, sh the shaded wall is extending into the, uh, out of the page. But here, below the, this beam, there's no wall. It's damaged by the impact. Now, you put the needle beam here, and you put the posts here. These posts should not be farther than four feet apart. And as I said, the needle beam needs to be at least three ply two by eight. Now, uh, the other typical detail for needle beam is also very common, where you have, um, like in this section, I'm showing the floor joist, the wall, concrete wall, concrete foundation wall, uh, footing. Here is the garage uh, concrete slab, and here's the concrete slab of the basement. And here I'm facing the stairs that are going up. At the top of the stair, you have a landing, and under the landing, it's an empty, empty space, like usually a storage. Now, if this wall is damaged, and you put a needle beam here, on this side, you put the shoring on the concrete of the garage. Here, you put the, sh you put the shoring post, and you cannot just put it on landing and leave it there. You also need to put another shoring post in that storage space under the landing. So as, as I said before, the shoring should, con should extend all the way to, to basement. So you need that shoring in the, under the landing. Now, what, hap what often happens is that the roof gets damaged and you, and you need to have prolonged shoring for roofs. So, Many roof structures sustain tree impact damage during fall, and in most cases, repair cannot be completed before winter. Usually, in shorts, want to continue to live in the dwelling. Now, you cannot repair it, and you cannot just leave it like that. So, adequate shoring is a must to ensure safe conditions under snow. Closing any physical holes is also important to prevent further damage. So, uh, now, if you have a severe damage to roof rafters, uh, you need to 
put struts under the rafters and extend it down to the basement using temporary shoring walls. And they, they stay there throughout the winter so you can do the repairs after the winter. And um, if there's damage to rafters and there are large holes in sheeting, and that happens a lot because it's a tree impact, it, it creates a hole in the sheeting and also damage uh, the rafters. You need to frame the hole and put sheeting on the hole um, and um, also put tarp around the sheeting and over the sheeting to prevent water penetration. Also, under the rafters, uh, you need to put struts. So you put install struts and you face nail it to the rafters. Um, and then the, st the struts are sitting on bottom plates. The bottom plates are sitting on existing joists. Below the seating joists, you have top plates and you just install a shoring wall. Now, um, a lot of times these shoring walls are inside a room or a family room, so it's kind of inconvenient. In those situations, you can use beams. I will talk about that. Uh, now, uh, if the damage to roof rafters is not very severe, you can just uh, use one line of struts, which is faced nailed to the rafter under the uh, fractured point, and then extend it down to the basement through a shoring wall. And of course, in, you always need to cover the hole in the roof. Now, as I said, the shoring wall uh, is uh, is in the way of a room. So in that scenario, uh, you can have a blind beam. Uh, and then at the ends of the blind beam, you can have shoring post. And the force of the blind beam can be transferred to the shoring posts using blocking. Now, as for typical details, uh, a lot of times there are damage to covered porch. So the roof of the covered porch is damaged and the deck is also damaged. So as I said before, um, in this scenario, you cannot put a vertical shoring here. So it needs to be a diagonal shoring or uh, a needle beam. Now, when you put the diagonal shoring, if I look at the bottom condition here, um, first of all, the diagonal shoring should be a minimum 75 degrees. And at the bottom, you need to have uh, folding wedges to make sure the diagonal shoring is engaged with a supporting pads. And the supporting pads should be secured in place with uh, spikes. At the top, you need to make sure that uh, you have the post and the post is at the top is notched and you have uh, a bottom block and a side block. And the reason for that is you have this vertical force here that needs to be supported. That's, that force is supported by the force inside the post. The force inside the post creates a, a horizontal force. Now, if you don't have this side support, uh, this post can kick in. Now, for diagonal bracing, uh, let's say the wood roof framing of a detached garage is consumed by fire. And uh, here in this illustration, we are not showing the brick veneer. So there's no roof here, um, it's all damaged. Now you need to put a diagonal bracing at 60 degrees uh, angle preferred, but for sure not less than 45 degrees. So you put uh, diagonal bracing here. Now, this is, this is where the uh, brick veneer would go. This is inside the garage. Now, uh, about diagonal bracing, let's say the roof is collapsed and the second floor exterior wall bracing 
uh, needs diagonal bracing. So the roof here is, let's say, consumed by fire. Um, let's say the fire in the kitchen. Um, so the roof is gone. Now, these walls need to be braced diagonally uh, with, with shoring uh, wall. Now, pay attention that at the bottom, I have a cleat, again, that is nailed to the floor joists. And those cleats uh, is to resist the lateral force of the shoring post. Without the cleats, the shoring post at the bottom can, can kick out. So this is very important. Uh, the other scenario is uh, roof and exterior walls of a, a bungalow or building is damaged by fire. Masonry veneer wall should be braced from outside uh, diagonally. And at the bottom, you need to uh, anchor the bottom plate or, or the cleats to the ground. So use 10 M bars to secure cleat to ground and embed two feet. So if I look at this detail here, you have the post, you have the folding wedges to make sure that the, there's full contact and you have the cleat and the cleat is anchored to the uh, ground. And also there's an, another anchor behind the cleat, just to make sure that this whole system doesn't kick out. So do's and don'ts. So in total, um, provide uh, diagonal bracing to foundation, exterior, and or veneer walls. Install supports under both the wall framing and brick veneer. And carry shoring walls supporting larger, large loads down to the basement. It's very important. You need to have complete load path. Do not erect shoring on compromised floors. If you have a compromised floor, uh, you need to find another shore, uh, shoring location or put blocking and extend the shoring to the basement. Provide adequate shoring to roof rafters or trusses and do not leave compromised roof unsupported, even if it's very small. Properly frame closures for large physical holes in the roof. Uh, do not just put tarp over the hole. It's not enough. It will not prevent, it will not, um, it will fail under snow. So. so to conclude this presentation, shoring is one of the most important responsibilities of emergency contractors. And it should be erected or supervised by an experienced framer. So always forward photographs of shoring to the engineer for input and uh, request immediate assistance of an engineer if the damage is significant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nabi. Yeah. Um, so um, this is the time for Q and A, guys. Uh, so please make sure you're submitting your questions uh, in the text box there in. Uh, go to uh, go to webinar. Um, so I'm just going to wait for some questions to come in. I just wanted to first take the screen, if you don't mind. Um, great. So just wanted to kind of let you guys know that we have a webinar coming up uh, in April, uh, April 14th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And it's specifically going to be talking about personal injuries, the various causes and damages done. Uh, personal injuries are a fact of life. We see them uh, obviously part of our jobs day after day. And um, specifically when it comes to our involvement as a forensic engineering firm, uh, we see quite a bit of incidents um, that are caused by negligence or defective products or equipment. And so we're, we're, we're very excited to kind of go through these scenarios with you guys. Um, 
we're going to be going through various case studies to, to talk about incidents and, and how we determine the causes of those incidents and render opinions. This is uh, obviously very, very much focused on bodily injury claims. Um, and uh, it does have a lot of uh, kind of a legal elements to this as well as technical elements um, focused on compensation, um, the claims process, of course, subrogation, and uh, some discussion on, on basic prevention. So um, we're very excited about this topic. There's a huge uh, excitement and demand from people's feedback to us. So uh, once you close the GoToWebinar um, uh, screen today in this webinar, it's going to prompt you to answer several questions in a, que in a questionnaire. One of the questions will be, do you want us to sign you up to the next webinar? So if you want to sign up to personal injuries, the cause and the da and damage is done, uh, hit yes there and we'll make sure we'll, we'll secure your spot. So we'll get back to um, the Q&A. I see a lot of questions coming in now. So let's start from the top. Um, so Navi, one question is coming in saying, why would shoring fail when we have blockings at the mid height while a permanent wall is considered well constructed under the same conditions? Why is this configuration okay for walls, but, but not for shoring? Is there any way to get, yes. Yes, Sorry, so so the wall for constructions, they have sheeting on both sides. Uh, that prevents the buckling. Uh, but when you uh, provide shoring wall and you just put uh, studs and you put blocking, um, as I showed you in one of my slides, uh, all those studs, if they're weak, uh, and they are weak because they can buckle around their weak axis, they can all buckle in one direction. So it's very important to put cross bracing um, or sheeting. You can put sheeting there. It's just that sheeting, um, you can put sheeting as well, like to uh, prevent buckling. Yeah, but in uh, the walls of the house, they have sheeting on both sides. Okay. Next question, what is the purpose of the needle beam? What difference does it make by adding it on top of the shoring post? Um, it's just to um, provide space for repair work. Like for example, if part of the wall is damaged and uh, let's say you cannot, um, um, if you put the shore, if you put the shoring posts inside the wall, like inside the plane of the wall, then you are blocking the uh, space of the repair work. So, uh, and also sometimes, also you don't, the floor joist below that wall is also damaged. So you cannot just put the shoring inside the plane of the wall. So you need to put shoring, uh, you need to put needle beam that extend a bit out of the wall and then put the shoring posts under the needle beam. So it depends on, I mean, ideally, ideally for sure, if you can, always put the shoring post under this uh, supported load. Uh, but if you cannot, uh, then the next option is needle beam. So a needle beam is um, not preferred. It's just something that uh, sometimes we have to do. Okay, great. Next question, do you see a lot of shoring done improperly? We've seen uh, a lot of times, yes. Like I should say, like especially when it comes to diagonal shoring, um, like especially for foundation walls, sometimes they, they miss it. Like they, um, they just miss that the, found the floor joist, let's say above the first floor joist is damaged. They just, miss that the concrete foundation wall is supporting the ground and it can uh, tip over so they they don't do that or we've seen a lot that uh, the garage wall is damaged they put shoring under the lintel of the brick veneer but the header beam 
the wood header beam is not uh, short. So we do see we do see that a lot too. Okay, great. Um, one question came in. I believe it was pertaining to um, slide 36. Let me just. The question is: Does the lower shoring wall need to go into the ceiling or just up to it? Let me try to flip through. I think it. I think this question came in around here actually. So the question is, does the lower shoring wall need to go into the ceiling or just up to it? So the short, well, well um, so this is, well, well for, okay, so, okay, yeah, so this is, this needs to go to the ceiling because you see here, uh, we are putting strut between the roof rafters and the ceiling joist, and then right below the ceiling joist, there needs to be a shoring wall. So the shoring wall should uh, extend to the ceiling joist. Okay. So if, if you I, if you go to the next slide here. Sure. No, so sorry, pre previous slide. So here you can, so here is, oh, okay, so that's good. So here you can see, <laughs> so here you can see that uh, you have under the ceiling joist, you have the top plates. The top plates are connected to the ceiling joist, and then you install the studs of the shoring wall. Above the ceiling joist, you install the bottom plate, two, two bottom plates, and then you install the struts that they go to the, the rafters. Great. Next question. If a shoring post isn't available, what lumber can be used in place of it? Uh, six by six, or you can use, um, well, depending on the situation, but uh, depending on the force, uh, three, two by six, four, two by six, so depending on the force that you have. But you can either buy uh, six by six or uh, um, to uh, create a built-up uh, column, technically. I think probably what obviously this is very, very much variable, depending obviously on the the, the structure itself and and the circumstances. Yeah. Probably what I would recommend to the person that submitted this question is to reach out to a structural engineer and get give them kind of a the rundown as to what's happened, and I'm sure you will get specific guidance on the on, on that particular occurrence. Yeah. Now I, I also need to add that uh, so for adjustable steel post, it's very convenient because you can just adjust the height. But if you are using uh, wood posts, just make sure that you use wedges to create tight contact between the supporting surfaces. Great. Okay, uh, will there be an issue if shoring or additional support is not removed after the repairs? After the repairs? Uh, well, after the re well, well, after the repairs, technically all shoring can be removed. Uh, I guess the question is, uh, can, can you, can you read the question? Yes. Will there be an issue if shoring or additional support is not removed after the repairs? So if the repairs are designed properly, technically after the repair, the structure should be good. So, But uh, if, if it's not removed, it does that cause any issues or is that just redundant support? It's just really, well, again, it depends on the specific situation, but in all the, in all these scenarios they talk about it don't see any issue if they're not removed um, unless it's a, a specific condition uh, I, yeah. I imagine that the person that submitted this maybe has seen a, a, a scenario where the shoring was not removed after the repairs and trying to figure out if that's something that would cause damage uh, I, I, okay. of any sort actually I actually need to add something. Now, in on this slide that you are on right now, let's say you do all the repairs and then you remove the shoring underneath the ceiling joist and you leave the 
the struts between the ceiling joists and the rafters. Okay, so let, let's say you leave that in place. What will happen is that under snow during winter, uh, the forces will be transferred to the ceiling joist through those struts, and that will generate cracking inside the ceiling gypsum boards. So like in this scenario, for example, I can see that if you are removing shoring, you need to remove the shoring wall underneath the ceiling joist and above the ceiling joist. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, next question, thank you very much, very informative. You mentioned this presentation will be on YouTube. Yes, that is correct. It's going, if you do a quick search on YouTube um, in probably about 24 hours, uh, you search origin and cause, and, uh, origin and cause forensic engineering. You will see all of our uh, videos and and our webinars, and uh, this one will be posted within 24 hours. Next question: At a, a scene, who is responsible to make sure the damaged areas is properly shored? Uh, it's the responsibility, so, so shoring is the responsibility of the contractor. Now, if you see unsafe conditions or you are not sure, contact the engineer immediately. So it, so it's really up to the contractor to make sure that they are up to standards, the, the onus is on them, I guess? Yeah, because they're, they're the first one who get to the scene. Yes. Right. So if it's a common scenario, uh, you can do shoring, but if there's something that you are not sure about, absolutely con immediately contact the engineer. Okay. Next question. For scenario four, why would it be necessary to shore the damaged walls that will eventually be demolished? Uh, can I see? Uh, yes, would I'm going to try to find scenario four. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, I guess. Yeah, next slide. Two, sorry about that. Oh, okay. So it depends on the situation. If it's in a crowded area, uh, those brick veneer can uh, fall on people so you, you just need to make you just need to be aware that those brick veneers are now unsupported and they are about to fall so either put a fencing around that area to prevent uh, people from coming to that area or put the diagonal bracing and actually the best uh, the best thing you can do is like after all the investigations and stuff demolish it as soon as possible, just to uh, eliminate all unsafe conditions. Great. Um, another question, how much of the shoring principles discussed today can be applied to ground digging, saving collapse or damage to neighboring properties? So uh, for that, some of them like diagonal shoring, uh, can be used in that, it's just that in that scenario, you have very large forces. So those diagonal braces or raker shores, they need to be uh, specifically designed by engineer and uh, better uh, geotechnical engineers. Like if you are ground digging, like beside a large building, especially multi-residential, multi-story residential build, just buildings, you need, those shorings need to be designed by a uh, geotechnical engineer. And again, depends on the scenario, but the, the concepts are the same. So you, you will have diagonal shoring. Those are like diagonal shoring wall. Uh, the, the studs needs to be braced, uh, cross bracing. So the bracing for those members are more um, extensive. And also, uh, you will have yeah rakers, uh, yeah. So those those need to be designed, unless it's a very small uh, a very small uh, excavation. But 
more often than not, those are uh, you you are dealing with large forces. Okay. Next question: In the diagram showing the wall between the dwelling and the house, you have two needle beams and four posts. Should there not be a support directly below the masonry wall between the needle beams, like a couple steel angles spanning on either side of the wall and resting on the needle beams? Um, Nabi, do you remember what scenario? Yes. So I don't exactly uh, remember the scenario, but understand what the question is asking. So when you put the needle beam, uh, well, actually, yes, yeah. So I guess um, th th there there was a damage to the wall, and uh, damage to the wall, you would have part of the wall uh, broken. You would put a loose, you put you would put an angle there, or actually a steel beam there, and then you put the needle beam, and then you put the posts. So that's that's right, yeah. If it's a if it's a garage door, they also already have overhead beam and loose angle but if it's just a wall then you need to put a beam and then the beam transfers the forces to the needle beam and then the needle beam transfers the forces to the posts yeah i guess you already awesome yeah. well that concludes our time thank you so much nabi um yeah, for you. all your help on this and thank you all for joining us today you will receive a completion certificate as i'd mentioned within a week or so so make sure you keep your eyes open for that um and as we mentioned before there will be a questionnaire that will pop up please make sure you provide your feedback it helps us tremendously thank you all once again and you have a great day thank you everyone thank you george